We're continuing in our series, the Pentecostal Charismatic Movement. We're on a new section this week. Um, we've got uh, last week was just a one-week section, and this week probably another one-week section. Depends on how uh, how far we get, uh, but it should be. And uh, we're going to talk about healing evangelists, healing evangelists, um, and that is something that um, became increasingly popular in the 1940s and 50s, the healing crusades. And the, <clears throat> there are really two doctrines at the heart of it, uh, and that is the doctrine, especially the doctrine of apostolic succession, the idea that, that uh, there are still those who God anoints to be able to, to heal, or, or in the case of one that we're going to look at, um, he doesn't claim to heal, he just claims to be God's vessel for healing. And uh, the other one is the doctrine of healing in the atonement. Healing in the atonement. Now it just so happens that our morning message today, and as we're going through uh, what we believe in why, and then the subject of separation, we're getting into the specific movements and teachings and ideas that we as a church need to be separate from. Some specific ones that are mentioned in our uh, in, in our uh, statement of faith. There's, I mean, there's a whole well, wide realm. You can't list them all, but there are some key ones that are especially applicable for today. And the one, and the one we're going to look at today happens to be the charismatic movement. Uh, but uh, so some of this will be an overlap, uh, but it'll be, it's distinct, but it'll actually fit together quite well. Uh, so uh, the healing in the atonement, we'll look at that a little bit more in the morning message. And we've already talked about some of the healing of the, in the atonement. And uh, in this series in Sunday school, we aren't getting to the specific doctrine and looking at them according to the Bible until the last part, the last section of this series. So we will get there. Right now we're, we're laying the groundwork of, of different uh, movements and the history of it and then Probably, and then coming more up to modern day, and then we'll get into the specific uh, doctrine of the Pentecostal charismatic movement. One of the key doctrines of the Pentecostal movement is healing in the atonement. It's the belief that, that Christ provided healing in the atonement. God doesn't want you to be sick. Uh, it doesn't bring God glory if you're sick, and, uh, and so he always wants you to be healed. And uh, it's a very popular doctrine, very common doctrine among Pentecostals and charismatics. Uh, but apostolic succession is also part of that, at the heart of this as far as the healing. And uh, thinking, hey, the office of an apostle still exists. The apostolic gifts have not ceased. And so we can still heal people like they did back in the days of the apostles. And there are various levels, varying degrees of how far people are willing to take it. So you have some, uh, like the I mentioned last week, though I don't, they're not charismatic. I don't, they're not even really that widely considered as a Pentecostal denomination with the Christian and Missionary Alliance has its roots in, uh, uh, the, it has ties to the Pentecostal movement and one of their doctrine is uh, healing being provided for in the atonement. But they don't have healing evangelists going around and put, laying their hands on people, they don't speak in tongues, they don't do that. So there, and then, but then you can go all the way to the other side of where people were flailing around, flopping around, and being slain in the spirit, and, and all of the, and, and so there's just a wide, wide variety of, uh, of different uh, subgroups in the Pentecostal charismatic movement. So when we talk about this, we're not, some of these doctrines are the same across the board, but then there are things that are done differently depending on who it is, what group it is. So it really depends on how far people are willing to take it. Uh, William Branham, and uh, we're not going to even cover all the ones. I'm, this, this series is based on the book, uh, The Pentecostal Charismatic Movements, the, the History and the Error by David Cloud, and he mentioned several different ones in here uh, in this particular section, and I'm not covering all of them. I'm covering just some of the key ones uh, that I wanted to bring your attention to the most, some of the most prominent ones. Uh, William Branham is uh, he lived from 1909 to 1965. He was one of the fathers of the Pentecostal healing movement, so very influential force in that. He was one of the biggest names in healing. He was a uh, Baptist who turned into a Jesus-only Pentecostal. We talked about that last week, uh, oneness Pentecostalism, that they don't believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost as being distinct yet one, but they believe in the oneness that Jesus is God, and then he'll manifest himself as he's the Father and he's the Spirit, and uh, 
but uh, uh, we talked about that last week, but he was a Baptist. He turned into a Jesus-only Pentecostal. And you'll find that many of these people in these different movements and denominations, they ended up coming out of either Baptist or something related. Uh, they decide to leave that and they go on uh, to something else in, in Pentecostalism uh, or some of the other denominations. And, uh, and he, was, he was definitely one of them. Uh, he believed he was an end times messenger. He was an end times messenger. He, and by the way, these people are all the same. They're just self-proclaimed messengers that for these last days, for these end times, God has raised me up specifically to bring God's message. And we already covered one guy who said, uh, you know, it's my baptism that is needed. You know, people who have been baptized, I don't care how many other times you've been baptized, you have to have been baptized by me. And, uh, and I mean, just I mean, talk about the, the self-centeredness uh, and of these people. Um, he claimed that beginning at age three he heard a voice that gave him spiritual guidance. And he then, he also claimed to be the angel of Revelation 3.14 and 10.7 and the, and the Elijah of Malachi 4. He also claimed to be God's end time messenger to the Laodicean church age, which is really uh, ironic because a lot of what we're covering is Laodicean church age to the core. I mean, the great falling away, the lukewarmness. I mean, it's uh, end times apostasy. Uh, he also had many unscriptural views. Beside his Jesus-only belief, and I'll get this one here, pay close attention. Beside his Jesus-only belief, he believed that Cain was a product of a relationship between Eve and the serpent, and that it was the nature of Eve, and that was the nature of Eve's sin rather than eating the fruit. So Eve had a relationship with the serpent, which resulted in Cain being born. And um, he taught that there was a restoration called God's seventh church age because he said denominationalism is the mark of the beast. He denied that the judgment of hell is eternal. He promoted the idea of end time apostles being raised up to perform great miracles and then they would be immortalized, which is called, uh, that's, that's referred to as the manifest sons of God doctrine. He predicted that the world council of churches under the control of Rome would absorb all the denominations. He, seemed, he also seemed to operate with a gift of soothsaying. Uh, he would name the names of people attending his meeting and describe past events and secret sins. And this boosted his credibility in people's eyes and made him more popular. He also claimed to be directed by a personal angel and given power by it. He also claimed that the angel taught him how to detect diseases by vibrations on his left hand. Now that reminded me of, of some of these chiropractors out there. Or was it chiropractors or naturopath, uh, some of these? They do, um, uh, what do they do? They, energy fields uh, to try to figure out what supplements you need. So they will give you, and we've, we've met one or two of them, I think, or yeah, uh, a few of them. And uh, so what they'll do is they'll have this little vial uh, with the substance in it, right? Have you hold the substance and then they'll put their hand where? Uh, Usually on top and push down. They put, oh, that's right. They push down on your arm and depending on your resistance, when you're holding that substance, depending on your resistance when they push your arm down, tells them whether or not you need that, whether, whether you need that supplement. Now that is, that is, that's witchcraft. That's witchcraft. Now some of these people that, that she's seen in the past, we didn't know she even know what she was getting into. And the problem is some of these, some of these people, um, uh, some of these people often even can be right in what they're saying. Which, I mean, just because they're right doesn't mean it's from the Lord. That's right. Just because they're right doesn't mean it's from the Lord. And so those are things we kind of put the pieces together as we went along and, and, uh, and, and that kind of stuff. You know, we kind of look at it and say, um, what, what's the scientific basis for that? Is there, is there something that, that, that's, no, it's a lot, and here's the thing, a lot of chiropractic is steeped in the New Age movement and spiritism and stuff. Not all chiropractors, I'm just saying, the founder of 
the, like the, the, the founder of chiropractic care uh, was new age guy, like a cultic guy. So the chiropractor we see now, um, uh, he, he claims to be born in Christian. And by the way, a lot of these chiropractors who do this are charismatics. Mm -hmm. A lot of them that do that stuff, holding the thing, they're charismatics. Yeah. So they'll claim to be Christians. I but had one that was actually came from a congregational church and did the exact same thing. Yeah, well, and that's... another one claimed to be Jewish. Cool. <laughs> 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 well, the congregation, that, doesn't, that one doesn't surprise me, but, um, but there's a lot of mysticism out there, and we're going to get into that more in the, in the morning service as well. But just because somebody seems right or sounds right doesn't mean that it's of God and that, that we should be partakers in it. And, um, and, and so at times you get yeah, like way like, well, is there something to that? I mean, these people are, you know, some of these people say they're Christians, and wouldn't they... Uh, if you look at the charismatic movement, all of them, they would say they're Christians and they're, they're steeped in occultism, Christianized occultism. But that, that's just what reminded me of that. It reminded me of that when the angel taught him how to detect diseases by vibrations on his left hand. It sounded very similar. Um, Kurt Koch was a German Protestant who wrote quite a bit about the occult. In his book, Occult ABC, Exposing Occult Practices and Ideologies, he wrote, Years ago, Branham told his interpreter, Peter Ruff, uh, Pastor Ruff, If my angel does not give the sign, I cannot heal. Ruff noticed several features of spiritism in the work of Branham and therefore stopped working with him. These angels of whom uh, Harry Edwards and Branham spoke are evil spirits masquerading as angels of light. As in many areas of the occult, we are here reminded again that the devil appears as an angel of light. Another evidence is the fact that neither Edwards nor Branham were able to perform cures when faced with born-again Christians who had committed themselves to the protection of Christ. And he says, in the case of Branham, I have experienced this myself. When he spoke in Karlsruhe in Lausanne, there were several believers among the audience, including myself, who prayed along these lines, Lord, if this man's powers are from you, then bless and use him, but if the healing gifts are not from you, then hinder him. The result, on both, uh, the result, on both occasions, Branham said from the platform, there are disturbing powers here, I can do nothing. When there were believers there praying to God, for God to hinder him, if this was not from God, he says, there are disturbing powers here, I can do nothing. Why? Because he was filled with the power of the devil. Now, I, I don't think I finished my thought about our chiropractor. Our chiropractor... Uh, the type of chiropractic he does is a very specific kind of chiropractic where it doesn't matter who is seeing you, they have everything in a chart of the areas they adjust and, and that is very scientific based. And then you could see, I could see that chiropractor, I could see the other chiropractor in the office and they would come in, they do the exact same kind of adjustment uh, based on what they see in the chart of where I need adjusted most of the time. That is, that's a proper kind of chiropractic care. It's a scientific based, uh, not something where they're f feeling and, and there's some that, that do that. They just kind of, you know, have to, yeah. The one naturopath I saw, that's, and I, I was trying to get some help when I was so sick, um, but she's like, I need to do a, a, a physical assessment on you. Well, as a nurse, that made sense to me. Okay, I understand you need to be able to physically. So that's what I thought. She has had me lay down, and I thought she was just doing an assessment. And then she's like, okay, I'm going to try to adjust you. I'm thinking massage, chiropractic, physical manipulation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then she's like, I'm trying to get your energy field. And I immediately went, uh-oh, in my mind. And I started praying right away to the Lord. Please, if there are any evil spirits here, I pray against them, and I ask you to hinder them right now. I don't know what she's doing. And after, I just keep praying along those lines. Lord, pr just protect me. Keep anything away that is not of you. And after about one or two <coughs> minutes, she goes, it's strange. I cannot get a feel of your energy field. I just can't seem to read it. And she says, I don't usually have this much trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then so then there's some chiropractic, which is a branch of chiropractic called network chiropractic, where they don't really even adjust you. They have you lie down, and that's more of the energy field type of things. And there's one here in town. Uh, and uh, that is spiritism. That's occultism. That's something that Christians should have no problem with. But here's what's happening is Christians, both based on the influence of the charismatic movement and their disillusionment with 
the modern, the traditional medicine industry, medical industry, are ending up in these people's orbits and, and influences in these places because of, well, traditional medicine just is, it has its own problems in a lot of areas. Uh, and then they get influenced by the charismatic movement as well, some of them. And so bo from both directions, people are going into more of that uh, and getting influenced by these things. And so we had to have tremendous discernment uh, and realize what is from God and what is not from God. And these things are not from God. And so he had uh, numerous just terrible unscriptural views. Um, false healings, false healings. Alfred Pohl was a leader in a Canadian Pentecostal denomination and he worked in one of Branham's crusades in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan in the late 1940s. He was so involved that he was right by Branham's side when he prayed over people who were bedridden after the healing services. Uh, David Cloud interviewed him for O Timothy magazine on February 21st, 1990 and in his book, Cloud, uh, Brother Cloud puts that whole interview in there of what was published and he goes into a lot of detail. It's much more than I could read here. But basically, Paul testified of the trail of heartache that Branham left behind when he would pronounce people healed. But they later died. So for example, if someone had cancer, he would, they'd be bedridden, they're sick, they have cancer, some other disease. He would supposedly heal them. And then they would say they're in great pain. And he'd say, that's, that's, that's normal. You're going to be in pain for three days while the disease gets worked its way out by the body. The body gets rid of the disease over three days time. Well, by that time, he's, he's long gone. You know, in three days, he's going to be long gone. Well, those people got sick and got sicker and they died, many of them. But so, but yet he was gone. So by the time his fraud was evident, they, you know, he's, he was on, off to his next uh, scheme. Uh, and there's also much occult activity, occultic activity. Voices tormented him. His hand vibrated and swelled. Lights followed him and fireball, fiery balls <coughs> supposedly danced around the room during the Crusades. The visitations Branham experienced frightened and confused him so much that he told his wife he hated them and that he was going to renounce them, though he never did renounce them. Even fortune tellers recognized his occultic powers. In the book William Branham, The Man and His Message, he said, what made me more scared than ever, every time I met a fortune teller, they would recognize something had happened, and that would just, it just nearly killed me. For instance, one day my cousins and I was going down through a carnival ground, and me, we, we was just boys walking along. So there was a little old fortune teller sitting out there in one of those tents. She said, say, you, come here a minute. And the three of us boys turned around and she said, you with the striped sweater, that was me. And I walked up and I, I said, yes, ma'am, what could I do for you? And she said, say, did you know there's a light that follows you? You were born under a certain sign. So uh, cultic activity, I think, you know, devilish influence wasn't from the Lord. Uh, he was also very influential. He was supported by Demas uh, Shikarian, founder of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International. He also influenced Oral Roberts, T.L. Osborne, Jack Coe, A.A. A. Allen, Kenneth Hagen, Kenneth Copeland, Catherine Coleman, Paul Kane, Earl Polk, Marilyn Hickey, and Benny Hinn. Wow. So he was very, a very influential figure and a forerunner of that healing movement. Uh, a couple of others uh, that we're going to look at. Um, one is the Charles and, uh, Charles and Francis Hunter. They were called the Happy Hunters. They would have healing crusades. They called them the Healing Explosion Crusades. And they brought in millions of dollars and sold many books and videos. And I'll tell you, and we'll see the, with the next one here, it's the same way. Uh, these people bring in massive amounts of money. Massive amounts of money. Kenneth Copeland and... and um, uh, Benny Hinn and all these guys, they bring in massive amounts of money even though if someone just looks at things based on scripture, takes a look and says, is this truly real? Is this of God or not? Uh, it is not hard to make that discernment. But when people are caught up in that and they become convinced of that, it is really hard to convince them otherwise. One of the most steadfast is, no, they just cannot see it in many cases. Uh, false healings. False healings. They, David Cloud personally witnessed two of their healing meetings, and both times the wheelchair-bound le people left unhealed and disappointed. 
During a healing crusade in the Philippines in 1988, Frances developed an eye infection, but her healing teams could not heal her. She went to the doctor for medication and later said she was embarrassed to find their book, How to Heal the Sick, in the waiting room. But there she is going to the, going to the doctor for her eye infection. <laughs> A federal judge ordered them to pay $300,000 to a 67-year-old California woman who was injured when she was slain in the spirit at one of their meetings. She fractured her back and spent two months in the hospital. Now, the Holy Spirit wouldn't do that. Yeah. She was supposedly slain in the spirit and fell backwards and you know, fractured her back. And by the way, I mean, if, if, if someone just reads some books and you read the history of these people, it's not hard to see the frauds they are. But many people don't take the time to look at that, and that's, you know, we're doing that now. We're looking at these things now, uh, and it is not hard, just time after time, repeated, 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 yet the people still flock after them and still send them their money and still go uh, think that they're actually healing people. Uh, the, final, the, the primary one here to, uh, today is um, who's, who is really directly connected to many people today is... Um, Oral Roberts. Oral Roberts. Uh, he lived from 1918 to 2009. Very, very prominent, very, very prominent healing evangelist. Uh, he was, I think I got my. Somehow I got my slides messed up here with him. Yeah, that looks more like Oral Roberts there. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let me see. I, I missed, I, I think I overwrote a couple of, of slides, so I'm not sure I'm going to have all of my uh, notes here. I'm not sure what I did there. Um, yeah, no, unfortunately, I'm, I'm missing some notes because I overwrote a couple of these slides. But uh, he was a faith healing pioneer. Uh, because, I mean, he, he perfected the, the healing crusades. Uh, he also was, I mean, we see more occultism with him, and I wish I had the notes for this. I don't have the notes here. Um, and uh, because of the way I'm doing my slides now, it's, it's uh, for the sake of video, I'm putting them on video a little differently. Uh, so I'm doing individual slides, so I just have some uh, overriding ones here. Uh, but he was more occultism. Now, the part about occultism I wanted to, to, to emphasize is that he believed that, uh, so I, I actually took some time, I took a little bit of time and I watched some videos of him. And uh, one of the things that he says is that he is, he is not the one who heals. God is the one who heals. But he uses this word several times, or this term several times, and he calls it point of contact point of contact. So by him laying his hand on somebody's head and doing, you know, whatever he does to them, depending on, you know, the person, um, then he believes he is the point of contact between people and God for God's healing to come through. Then he also told the people, and I think he prayed over somebody, he says, yeah, you're not up here to lay hands on them, but outstretch your arms as a point of contact. So by, by people outstretching their arms while the prayer is going on, that is supposedly having something to do with spiritual energy. And that's occultism. That's witchcraft. That's divination, sorcery, whatever word that fits, fits there. Um, it's just witchcraft. It's occultism. And... Uh, that is very common, though, the raising of hands. Now, there's nothing in, inherently wrong if, you know, if someone's, you know, someone says, hey, man, you know, you raise your hand up while you're saying, oh, thank you, Lord, and, you know, that kind of thing. There's a difference between raising your hand that way and reaching your arms out during prayer or, or, or like this because it's what they're doing is it's a point of contact. It's spiritual energy that they are trying to receive. That's why there's so many of them when you see in these, uh, these praise of charismatic worship songs and they, they'll, they'll get into a, kind of get worked up and they'll raise their hand, they'll just move their hands like this or they'll just go like this. And, and uh, why is that? Because they're divining spiritual energy. 
Uh, there, um, at the, uh, there's, there's one so-called healing evangelist, uh, uh, modern day healing evangelist named Todd Bentley. And uh, he was at the, um, he, he went to the, the so-called revival that's taken place at Asbury in Kentucky, Asbury College or University or whatever it is in Kentucky. So they've had this constant, these constant services and meetings all week long for the last uh, more, about a week and a half now. And people are just flocking there and, and all those things. But he said he wants to take the energy there. He was there just to sit there a few couple days or a couple hours or however long he was there. But he said when he goes to one of his other meetings, he wants to go release that energy in that meeting. That's, that's occultism, that's spiritism, witchcraft. Um, so uh, the deception and false healing. Uh, Roberts Magazine called Healing Waters featured three great medical doctors congratulating Oral Roberts. Men who inquired with the American Medical Association found out that none of them were medical doctors. One of the three men was found operating as a naturopath in Phoenix, and no organization headed by one of the other men was discovered. It was claimed that one of the other men had, he, he headed a society that had over 20,000 physicians. Well, no, upon further investigation, you know, if you head of a society has 20,000 physicians, you would think it's not that hard to find, but these, there were some men who looked into it and they couldn't find anything. Uh, in one of his videos that is on the Oklahoma S Historical Society's YouTube channel, Robert swears to the authenticity of what you, he, he's, he's saying, what you are about to see. He, he, so he signs this affidavit and he reads it. Actually, first he reads it. And he's swearing that what you are about to see is completely authentic, it's completely real, it's none of it was staged and none of it was, you know, whatever words he uses in that. And the, supposedly there's a judge sitting next to him. And the thing looked as phony as a $3 bill, to be honest with you. <laughs> Unless it was a true judge, but he was an Oral Roberts fan. That's possible. Um, but he's there and he reads this. He's like, all right. Uh, or first, you know, do you solemnly swear? And, you know, and I solemnly swear. And he reads it and then he signs it and he sh like shakes his hand and... Now, if you got to do that before your healing program, that's, that's very telling right there. Now, the thing looked very flimsy and fake as, as could be anyway. Uh, but then I watched part of the healing program, and um, many of the people who came to him were ones that had, let's, let's just say it wasn't ones where you could clearly know for sure that these people were healed because it was stuff that was, well, my eyesight's bad. It wasn't somebody who was blind, it was my eyesight's bad, or my, my hearing, I don't really have hearing in my right ear, or you know, a woman supposedly had a lump in her, uh, uh, had something going on, and, and this other woman, and, and they came from all different kinds of churches. This one's from the Baptist church, this one's from the Church of Christ, this one's from whatever church, and the Assembly of God, and so we'd have these people up here, and uh, go up there, and, and uh, and he, I mean, he was, he was slick. Oh my goodness, is he ever slick? Very well-spoken and very convincing, very clean-cut guy. And, and, and so people would just flock there. But, uh, I mean, you'd kind of have to just see it to, to, get a, to get an idea of what it is. It's a very interesting, that particular video, I saw another video. But there was one boy who had, so he said, well, I might, you're, you're blurry, or, or maybe it was a woman. It was a woman who said, yeah, you're blurry from the back. Uh, when I'm sitting in the back, you're blurry. And as she's standing in front of him, and he supposedly heals her, he says, oh, I, what, what, I can, how do you see me now? Oh, I'm clear as day. She says, oh, you said it before, it was blurry. Well, that was from the back. I don't know if it was still blurry when from the back. She might have just needed glasses, you know, I don't know. <laughs> but... Um, there was a little boy, little boy who comes up with his father, and and um, and honestly, some of these responses from people, either these people were really programmed, like really into him already. Just some of the things they said, it sounded scripted. It just, it just, it just looked scripted to me. I'm not saying it was. I'm just saying it just kind of reminded me of that. But these people kind of just seemed to be in a daze and a stupor, like oh, they're they're enamored, and. Uh, 
so he's putting his hands on this boy's eyes because he had some eye problems. And he puts his right hand. Now the other guy we looked at, Branham, said it was his left hand. Well, Oral Roberts was his right hand, is what God used for healing. And he puts his hands on this boy's eyes, and he's there, and then all of a sudden he goes, and you see the, I mean, he's got his fingers right on his eyes, and he just, oh, oh, I'm sorry to hurt you. You know, the Holy Spirit did that, was, you know, was, was doing that to my arm, my hand, like the Holy Spirit, you know, caused him to push these boys, <laughs> push on this boy's eyes. And, uh, Supposedly this boy was healed, but very, very broad, very vague, very generalized is what a lot of these things were. And uh, you don't see them, you don't see them uh, uh, healing those who are crippled, like truly crippled. Now there have been a lot of healing evangelists that have staged crippled people being healed, but... Um, you don't see that. I didn't see that in the video I watched at least. Other people who've looked into these things a bit closer found no cases of healing upon further investigation. In Amarillo, Texas, oh, there was another one that a boy, I think it was a boy who stuttered. He stuttered. And supposedly then he could just speak clearly afterwards. So very subjective things that could be very easily staged or if they're in a place where there's a lot of adrenaline flowing through them and they're really excited, they might feel better initially. So in Amarillo, Texas, a terrible storm pulled at and ripped the tent which landed on the crowd. About 50 people were hurt, but they were all taken to the hospital where they recovered. Apparently they weren't healed on the spot by Oral Roberts. Uh, Roberts had a heart attack in 19, I had a couple of heart attacks, but in 1992 he had his first heart attack only hours after Paul Crouch supposedly healed him of chest pains on a TBN broadcast. So he was healed of chest pains by Paul Crouch on TBN, but then a few hours, you know, some hours later he had a heart attack. And so once again, these people, if you look at, uh, if you look at these things, they are uh, very clearly, uh, just, just clearly not, not things of God. 900 foot tall Jesus. That's what Oral Roberts is also known for. <laughs> yeah. He opened the City of Faith Medical Center after God instructed him to in 1977, but it was the source of immense financial problems. In 1980, Roberts claimed a vision. He said, I felt an overwhelming holy presence all around me. When I opened my eyes, there he stood, some 900 feet tall looking at me. He stood a full 300 feet taller than the 600 foot tall City of Faith. There I was face to face with the King of Kings. He stared at me without saying a word. Oh, I will never forget those eyes. And then he reached down, put his hands under the city of faith, lifted it, and said to me, see how easy it is for me to lift it? Now, because he was str struggling with financial problems with this because it took a massive amount of money, this medical center. And, uh, and, and so this made him feel better. God reassured him about the situation, the financial situation, because see how, see how easy it is for me to lift it? That was in Oral Roberts in American Life. And the final one here, this has to do with money, money, money. Money, money, money. In January of 1987, Roberts told his TV audience that God told him that he must raise $8 million within the next 12 months or he would die. The money was supposed to pay for scholarships for students attending his medical school at Oral Roberts University, founded Oral Roberts University. In April, he announced that he had received $9.1 million with a large, and a large portion of that had actually come from the owner of a dog racing track, which involves gambling. He eventually closed the medical school and City of Faith to pay down debt. And amazingly, people still did not reject him as a false prophet and a phony. His fundraising techniques are still widely used by Pentecostals, uh, by Word of Faith Pentecostal preachers. He had a funny fundraising method that led the way for the Seed of Faith doctrine. His book titles uh, also say a lot about him. Now that Seed Faith doctrine is, is uh, yep, you plant that seed of faith, you send us money, God's going to abundantly bless you, He's going to match that, He's going to exceed that, He's going to give you all that. Just plant that seed. So his book titles say a lot about him. God's formula for success and prosperity, deliverance from fear and sickness, don't give up, Jesus will give you the miracle you need. Expect a miracle, flood stage, opening the windows of heaven. 
If you need healing, do these things. The miracle of Christ and what they mean to you for all your needs in the now. And the miracle of seed faith. But he also had family problems. Of his four children, three divorced. Two of those who got divorced came out as homosexuals. And then one of those later committed suicide. Uh, his son Richard uh, kind of carried on more of his business, so to speak, or he was also the head of Oral Roberts University. Uh, but he resigned in 2007 due to the allegations and suspicion, but apparently strong allegations, of him and his wife misusing ministry funds. And so he resigned. And so uh, Richard just carried on with many of his father's errors. But family problems, definitely not, uh, definitely not a spirit-filled uh, result in the family uh, by a guy who supposedly was anointed of the Lord to heal. And so, but Oral Roberts, tremendously influential. I mean, Oral Roberts University exists today. Uh, back in its uh, prime, in its heyday, it had uh, about 5,000 students. And so it's not nearly as um, influential today as it used to be. But his ministry, his teaching, the things that he did, had a profound impact that get carried on today in many other people, through many other people. And that's what happens with the charismatic movement is you get one person, you, you see one person for the fraud they are, but there's a hundred others, a thousand others out there to carry on, and people, then the deception continues, the fraud continues, the, the witchcraft continues. And that's what, and I will say this, I, I will say this unashamedly, the charismatic movement is Christianized witchcraft is what it is. It is Christianized witchcraft. And that is not too strong of a term to use to describe it. When you, when you look at well, all of what goes on in the charismatic movement, it is related. It's the same things that happen regarding witchcraft. It's occultic, it's, it's, it's mysticism, and, uh, and that is absolutely what the charismatic movement is. And uh, for Christians, Bible-believing Christians, it should just be rejected out of hand. And that includes, that includes the charismatic music, the contemporary Christian music that is by charismatics and for charismatics. That's what it was made for. And it should just be completely rejected. And re we do recognize it for what it is. For protection, for the glory of God, to stay faithful, to stay grounded in God's word, to not get carried away by seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And, uh, and we need to call these things as they are. And recognize the danger, recognize the error.